and we'll look at approaches to the brain stem. We'll start to think about that. If you're going to expose that area, um, what approach are you going to use? Um, uh, we're on the lateral side of the peduncle. Uh, and you want to expose this area. Uh, what uh, approach are you going to use? Anyone? You'll use, how about subtemporal approach? Now, what if you want to take that sub, uh, subtemporal approach and extend it downward to the area below the trigeminal nerve? Uh, what do you call that approach? That will be a, a quasi anterior petrosectomy approach so that. A Kawase approach will deliver you down below the trigeminal nerve to the anterolateral brain stem. Now, if you want to expose the interpeduncular fossa or a low basilar bifurcation coming down the midline, and the approach is one that we'll deal with tomorrow that we call transcavernous approach. Uh, but it delivers you from the front through a OZ craniotomy down to the interpeduncular fossa. Now, what approach have we looked at today that exposes the area from the lower edge of the trigeminal nerve down to nine and has seven and eight in the center, what are you going to call that approach? Anyone? Help me. Uh, we've looked at it already. That's what approach? Trans lab approach or retro lab. And if you want to extend it medially then, what do we call that approach? Up to the midline, along the clivus, adjacent to the sixth nerve, that's trans-cochlear approach. And then if you want to take these approaches, a trans-lab or retro-lab, and extend it at along the lateral brain stem above the uh, tentorium. That's a combined supra-infratentorial pre-sigmoid approach. And uh, you can do it retrolab, translab, or if you want to extend it medially, then you can do a transcochlear combined supra-infratentorial pre-sigmoid approach. Now the workhorse of the posterior fossa we talked about initially, and you can see four, five, it gets you down below seven and eight to nine, 10, 11, and you even have access to 12 in retro-sigmoid approach. So it's really the workhorse approach of posterior fossa. Now, for this area, this will be part of the focus tomorrow, but you can come to collicular plate area, pineal, either supra or infratentorial approach from the back, and if you want to access fourth ventricle, we call that telovelar approach. Uh, and so these are the approaches that we often use from the back side. Uh, and we've talked about this approach, which is to lateral medulla,
foramen magnum, far lateral approach. We can also come transoral. And today, some of the endoscopic approaches, here's the area that you can reach at times using the endoscopic approaches. One great thing about the endoscopic approaches is they deliver the operative focus to the area between the cranial nerves. The subtemporal, retrosigmoid, uh, anterior petrosectomy, translab, far lateral, all come in on the lateral side of the cranial nerves. Anytime you go from lateral to medial, working from lateral, medial to the cranial nerves, the risk of the operative approach goes up. And so the endoscopic transnasal approaches are gaining wider usage today for much of this pathology. We still have problems with those with CSF leak and closure, but still as we understand that anatomy better, we're getting better with lower complication rates with these approaches. So let's just take a quick look at each of them in 3D. Here's subtemporal approach. We're on the left side, frontal, occipital back here, and here we work under the temporal lobe, and we get it delivers us down to the side of the peduncle at the midbrain pons junction. We see the what nerve? Trochlear three, and we can get a little bit lower if we divide the tent here behind where the fourth nerve enters the tent, and that will get us down to where we often see a little bit of the trigeminal nerve, but it gives us this lateral side of the peduncle here between three and four posterior cerebral. Now, if we want to extend that approach downward, we can use the Kawazi approach, and we said that it comes through the floor of middle fossa, and what sets in this area that we always want to preserve? We want to do our anterior petrosectomy while preserving hearing and the cochlea so that we can go to the internal acoustic meatus or we can drill out the petrous apex under the trigeminal nerve down to the side of the clivus along the inferior petrosal sinus and the sixth nerve in the anterior petrosectomy approach. And for this approach, we want to work medial to the internal acoustic meatus. We don't want to enter the meatus that we've looked at. We want to preserve the cochlear angle and we'll work behind the greater petrosal nerve and take out the petrous apex, drill down to the side of the clivus along the inferior petrosal sinus, under the superior petrosal sinus, we open the temporal dura open across the superior petrosal sinus and the tent down to the side of the clivus in the anterior petrosectomy approach. We can elevate the temporal lobe then and have access to the peduncle and midbrain, and then we can work above and below the trigeminal nerve down to the front of the brain stem and along the side of the clivus. Always in these approaches, we want to preserve vein of la bay and the what nerve? 
trochlear nerve when we divide the ten. And it's a, one of the most commonly used routes to the low basilar bifurcation to cavernomas of the anterolateral brain stem. Uh, now, transcavernous approach that delivers us to the interpeduncular fossa, we'll talk about these approaches tomorrow that here we were optic nerve carotid. Usually in this area we don't work between the optic nerve and carotid, but we elevate the carotid and work between the carotid and third nerve below the posterior communicating artery and we take off the anterior clinoid and then we elevate the carotid and work between the carotid and the third nerve. And the third nerve where it enters the roof of the cavernous sinus is in a short cistern and we can pass a nerve hook into the cistern and open the oculomotor cistern and then we can work between the carotid and third nerve to expose posterior clinoid, dorsum, and then we can drill off the dorsum uh, and posterior clinoid, and it gives us this approach down the midline to the basilar P1s to the interpeduncular fossa using a transcavernous approach, and we'll talk more about this tomorrow. It's a supratentorial exposure. Then for this part of the brain stem, the collicular plate, the pineal region, we can come in either above or under the tentorium. And uh, if we come in under the tent over the apex of the vermis, it's very difficult to retract enough in the midline in a median approach to get down from the superior to the inferior colliculus to the fourth nerve. Uh, but this is the median approach under the tent over the apex of the vermis. We can see pineal, internal cerebral, basal vein, superior, but we can't get down to the inferior colliculus or the fourth nerve coming in in the median infratentorial. But if we move off paramedian, off the apex of the vermis, then we can get in to superior, inferior colliculus, we can see the fourth nerve here below the inferior colliculus. We have access to SCA, posterior cerebral artery. We can even work all the way to the peduncle here in the area of the crural cistern. But we talk more about this approach tomorrow. But usually to get down to the inferior colliculus, if you're coming in below the tent, you need to come in paramedian off of the apex of the vermis. You can also come in occipital transtentorial. There are usually no bridging veins uh, here uh, below the lambdoid suture and the torcula. The veins at the back of the hemisphere are directed forward and so that there are usually no bridging veins here below the lambdoid suture and you can get in, retract the occipital lobe, expose pineal, posterior fox, tent. You can divide the tent adjacent to straight sinus have access to the pineal, and you also get access to superior and inferior.
colliculus, and tectoplate. Uh, so these are approaches to the posterior part of midbrain. And you have access also to posterior corpus callosum coming in occipital transtentorial. Um, now we move down in the midline and over to the side in the telovelar and retrosigmoid approaches. And telovelar approach we've talked about. We retract the tonsil away from the uvula. You see the tela below the inferior medullary velum. The velum stretches from the nodule on the front of the uvula over to the flocculus. You open the tela. You have access all the way up to the aqueduct. You open the velum. You have access to superolateral recess. Here's the superior peduncle passing from the dentate that wraps around the superior pole of the tonsil and is passing up toward the red nucleus. But dividing the tela gives you access to most of the floor and accessing the velum and opening it gives you access to the superolateral recess so that rather than dividing the vermis which can cause a mutism syndrome in young people, it's usually transient. We retract the tonsils away from the side of the uvula. We open the tela above Majande to access the floor of the fourth. We open the velum to access the superolateral recess. And then if the pathology extends out the lateral recess, uh, it's roof below the lower half of the roof of the lateral recess is formed by tela and velum. We see the dorsal cochlear nucleus, the side of the auditory brainstem implant in the lateral recess. So to access the lateral recess, we elevate the tonsil. We see, see the tela lining the lower margin between Majande and Lushka. We open the tela and we have access to the lateral recess. So using telovelar approach, we have access to all of the floor of the fourth, the peduncular mass, the superolateral recess, and over to the lateral recess, but it accesses all of these areas of the fourth ventricle. And here we see again the dorsal cochlear nucleus, the side of the auditory brainstem implant. Here the velum, a paper thin membrane lining the lower margin of the superolateral recess. Now, the workhorse of this area, and we've talked about it, is retrosigmoid approach that gives us access from above five along the lower margin of the tent down to the foramen magnum. And it accesses all of this area of this CP angle formed by cerebellum folding around the lateral pons, and the middle cerebellar peduncle so that we can work from four and SCA down to five along the internal acoustic meatus down to nine, 10, 11. And the approach also gives us access then to the internal acoustic meatus, the nerves at the fundus, and using the approach, we can drill further lateral then into the labyrinth. For a more localized approach to the CP angle from usually 
Five is at the upper edge, nine at the lower edge. Maybe you see 10, depending on the height of the jugular bulb. We can use a translab approach, and we can extend that medially with drilling out the cochlea in the petrous apex so that we work through the mastoid. We find the mastoid antrum superficial to the labyrinth. We can open the dura retrolab and save hearing, or we can drill out the lab. We can do a partial labyrinthectomy with some chance of preserving hearing in which we drill the superior and posterior canal. But if we need to get into the internal acoustic meatus uh, for pathology that extends into the meatus, we have to sacrifice hearing and drill out the labyrinth to get into the internal acoustic meatus. If the pathology is medial to the porous, in the CP angle, we can just open the pre-sigmoid dura, preserve the labyrinth, and do a retro lab exposure. And if we need to get medial in, we can work around the facial nerve, drill out the cochlea, in a transcochlear approach that delivers us through the petrous apex down to the front of the pons along the edge of the clivus and the inferior petrosal sinus to the side of the basilar artery. And then if we need to combine exposure of this area with exposure along the lateral brain stem, then we can do a combined supra-infratentorial pre-sigmoid approach. We can do that retrolab, translab, or we can extend it medial, drilling out the cochlea. So this is the combined supra-infratentorial pre-sigmoid approach. Here we have the labyrinth, and we open the temporal dura, open pre-sigmoid, and the exposure of the posterior fossa. We divide the tent, preserving four. An important consideration always is la bay. And then if the pathology is further medial along the clivus, we can move the facial nerve backwards and work through the petrous apex in a transcochlear approach that delivers us down to the side of the clivus along the sixth nerve. We divide the tent, preserving four, in a combined supra-infratentorial pre-sigmoid approach, uh, and in this case, the transcochlear variant. Uh, you can come to lower brain stem through transoral approach. Uh, the soft palate hides this area, so it really is difficult to get much above the edge of the foramen magnum, but it gives you C1, the odontoid, and here we have the uvula. Uh, we've divided it. Today, most of these approaches are being Many of them are being converted to transnasal endoscopic, but here we see longus coli, longus capitis. Uh, dividing the uvula gives you access to lower clivus, anterior arch of C1, and you can access some of the lower brain stem, transoral, but today, uh, Many of these approaches are being converted to transnasal endoscopic approaches. Here's just our far lateral approach, and we work through the suboccipital triangles. Um, we reflect the muscles of the suboccipital triangle. Um, and here's just the far lateral exposure. 
it's better than just retrosigmoid, but still the condyles can give a significant obstruction to the view of the clivus and the front of the brain stem. But with the, if you drill out the condyle here, you can pull this dura further lateral for access to the front of the brain stem or to the lower clivus, and you can drill out then transcondylar and get access to the lower clivus for lesions involving lower clivus or extending across in front of the medulla to the contralateral vertebral artery. And then what can you see with the endoscopic approaches? Well, the endoscopic approaches today are being used to give us access from anterior fossa down along the front of the brain stem down to the area of foramen magnum. And they have the advantage of coming in medial to this line of cranial nerves that you have to work across coming from lateral. So just a quick look at the clivus, which we divide into upper, middle, and lower parts. And as we look at clivus, why you can do very focal approaches to the lower, middle, or through the upper part of the clivus and sphenoid sinus to the area of the cavernous sinus. But lower clivus, you can access hypoglossal canal, medial edge of jugular foramen. Mid clivus gives you access to seven and eight, basilar artery, and then through upper clivus or through this back wall of the sphenoid sinus, you have access to medial part of cavernous sinus. So here's lower clivus. Um, here's atlantal occipital condyle, hypoglossal canal. Here, jugular foramen, hypoglossal canal to the opposite side. Here, the hypoglossal canal has been drilled out. We see 9, 10, 11. Then we can, you can work to the other side, 9, 10, 11, 12th nerve coming through hypoglossal canal. And drilling out approaches like this that the fellows do that have worked with us in the lab, I'm constantly amazed with how accurate, how precise, how careful these approaches can be done. Uh, that's really the magic of microsurgical anatomy. You can, here we just see hypoglossal canal 9, 10, 11, uh, and on the other side. And here we go up to the upper third of clivus that sets in the posterior wall of sphenoid sinus. We don't have much time to talk about this today, but working through this area, you have access to cavernous carotid, pituitary, uh, and here the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. Here we see right cavernous sinus, anterior medial wall, three, sixth nerve, uh, V2 down in this area, V1 here, and then you can look through this area to the other cavernous sinus, looking over the cavernous carotid ophthalmic artery. And when you remove that posterior wall then of upper clivus, you have access to mammillary bodies Basilar apex, posterior communicating, P1, P2, uh, and then you can access mid clivus here. When we drill it off, you have access to mid basilar artery, pons. Here you see the vidian nerves preserved in the vidian canal, then the contralateral exposure, so you see upper, mid, 
lower clivus and these very focal approaches that pass through the clivus and anterior fossa along the medial side of the cranial nerves. They don't put the nerves at risk from coming from lateral to medial. Uh, but here's just the endoscopic view of the area from cella. You can get along the planum all the way down to foramen magnum. You can get to a dontoid, but we see anterior medial cavernous sinus, sixth nerve passing through the dura, entering the cavernous sinus, seven and eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, through these approaches that come in medial to the line of cranial nerves. Here we've drilled off to one side. Um, here the petrous apex, and we've worked below the trigeminal nerve, taken out the petrous apex. We see some of the superior petrosal veins, this vein coming off of the pons, and seven and eight from the front side. Just think about a focal approach to this area for a decompression of the facial nerve right here or a microvascular decompression of the trigeminal nerve. Is that going to happen by this route? I think someday it probably will, but we still have more to learn about these endoscopic approach. Here's seven and eight viewed from the front side. Um, so that for coming in along the midline and front, we do have an approach that will deliver us medial to these lateral approaches that cross the cranial nerves. For more details about these approaches, please see the other lectures in the Roten Collection.